order. Um, the subject of today's hearing is, fis is the fiscal year 2025 budget request for FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. I know for those of you uh, committee veterans, which is everybody but me, um, it's traditional to give an opening statement at this point in time. Um, and as the newest member of the committee, I'm sure that nobody is looking forward to what I might make up for an opening statement, so we're going to skip that. Um, and uh, with that, I would uh, um, recognize our ranking member, Mr. Cuellar, for your opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I congratulate you on the new role as chairman of this sub uh, subcommittee and welcome and look forward to working with you in a bipartisan way. I do. Uh, I am a uh, tradition, so I will have my uh, opening statement. Uh, again, Administrator Criswell, uh, it's uh, nice to have you here. And we, uh, uh, I think this year we celebrate 45 years of uh, FEMA uh, working uh, with folks and, of course, helping them with their disasters before, during, and after. Uh, we want to thank you and the thousand of the FEMA staff for their dedication and the commitment for serving our country when we need it. Uh, we're just talking about hurricane season. Uh, and again, your job doesn't get any easier uh, every year, but again, you all have been working uh, in a tremendous way. Uh, this year, uh, we uh, know that there is a lot of work to be done. Funding has become tighter, fewer resources, but again, uh, we want to work with you, and we certainly are happy that we're able to include the New authority in the recently enacted 2024 funding that allows the entire department to access an employee emergency backup care program. Uh, and again, uh, working with the Office of the Health Security, we certainly want to make sure we work on workforce wellness and telemedicine health and employee assistance pilot program. Uh, we also uh, want to talk about um, learning a little bit more about staffing challenges. Uh, I think Homeland is, is one of those agencies that, you know, we're heavy on personnel, not on capital, but on uh, uh, employees. So we certainly want to work with you on that. Um, we also uh, want to make sure that we talk about a little bit about the um, $650 million that uh, went off to the Food and Shelter Service Program. As you know, this is a program that I started some years ago. It was a commit, it was a border-based type of funding, but over the years, we know what's happened in New York and other places, uh, but certainly I have a few questions on that. Certainly want to talk to you about Stone Garden Operation Stone Garden. That's so important for our law enforcement folks to work with Homeland. Uh, but with that, I will try to be um, say uh, thank you, uh, Administrator, and look forward to hearing from your testimony and ask you questions. Thank you so much. Thank you to the gentleman from the Lone, Lone Star State. Uh, I would like to thank you for being here, um, Madam Criswell, and, and uh, we will uh, recognize you now for a, a summary of your written testimony, which will be included in our record. Thank you, Chairman Amade and Ranking Member Cuellar and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the President's $33.1 billion budget request for FEMA for fiscal year 2025. Emergency management has changed in recent years and emergency managers across the country are being asked to do more. FEMA is no exception. And to support communities across the nation, FEMA must have commensurate funding. Whether it is a wildfire, a flood, a derecho storm, or other disaster, it is vital that FEMA be able to tap into an adequately funded disaster relief fund. FEMA's total request includes $22.7 billion for the DRF to respond to new and ongoing disasters. This is a $2 billion increase over fiscal year 2024 funding levels to support continued recovery efforts, such as those in Maui after the most devastating wildfires in the island's history. At the DRF's present funding levels, FEMA may need to resort to immediate needs funding before the end of this current fiscal year so as to preserve remaining DRF balances for life and safety response operations and other critical survivor needs. To mitigate INF risks, I urge the committee to act on the disaster supplemental request for fiscal year 2024, which requested an additional $9 billion for the DRF. FEMA requires not only a fully funded DRF, but also a well-trained workforce ready to deploy at a moment's notice. The fiscal year 25 budget provides $2.4 billion in personnel pay, compensation, and benefits because workforce well-being, recruitment, and retention are critical. 
One of my priorities for this year is continuing to boost the capacity of state, local, tribal, and territorial partners to respond to extreme weather events. There is no longer a disaster season. Natural disasters occur throughout the entire year, often concurrently and in places that are not accustomed to them. I talk to state directors regularly, and in nearly every conversation, they ask for help improving their capacity to address this year-round disaster response tempo. And as FEMA continues to adapt to the rapidly intensifying disaster cadence, one thing is clear. FEMA is more than just a response and a recovery agency. <coughs> FEMA helps communities become more resilient and better prepared before a disaster strikes. One way FEMA achieves this goal is through grant programs. Grants aid our, our SLTT governments and the private sector to help build operational capabilities needed to implement preparedness strategies and reduce or eliminate long-term risks to people and property. FEMA's fiscal year 25 budget request includes $3.2 billion for grants to help safeguard our communities, our citizens, and support our nation's first responders. For example, FEMA's budget request includes an increase of $25 million each for the assistance to firefighters grant and the staffing for adequate fire and emergency response programs, better known as the AFG and SAFER programs. An increase to these programs will enable FEMA to provide additional financial assistance directly to eligible fire departments, non-affiliated medical service organizations, and state fire training academies. Another critical tool is the Nonprofit Security Grant Program, which provides funds for physical security enhancements and other security-related activities for nonprofit organizations at a high risk of terrorist attack. FEMA's fiscal year 25 budget requests $385 million, an increase of $110 million above the enacted level for fiscal year 24 for the Nonprofit Security Grant Program. To expand the program to more nonprofit organizations in both high risk urban and rural areas. The budget request also includes $1 billion for the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Grant Program. These grants support SLTT mitigation projects, which reduce risks posed by disasters and natural hazards. We also recognize that on average, disaster-related floods lead to more deaths every year than any other natural event. FEMA is requesting $364 million for flood hazard mapping and risk analysis, an increase of $51 million. This will help modernize FEMA mapping and assist communities as they prepare for future flooding conditions. Constituents in your districts and neighborhoods across the nation rely on FEMA more than ever before and our fiscal year 25 budget request provides the necessary resources to meet our mission of helping people before, during, and after disasters. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Madam Administrator. Now we'll go to our ranking member, uh, Mr. Cuellar. The floor is yours for questions. Thank you. Uh, can I ask you about the uh, food and shelter program? Uh, as I mentioned, this is a program that when uh, our former chair, Kay Ranger, and myself were in Laredo, we saw the needs for this. So we established this, I think, 13 or 14, uh, but it was supposed to go with funding from the uh, state government. Our governors didn't want to do this soft type of work uh, using this federal dollar. So I think it was in 2017, we changed the delivery mechanism put the original $30 million, and of course, it went to 100, 800, now we're at 650. One of the things uh, that I always look at is, where does money go? Because it was originally for a border, because uh, that's where most of the, uh, that's where the migrants come in. Uh, you all made a initial $275 million uh, this last week to 55 recipients. So, you know, I have a series of, of questions. One is, how do you make sure that with the top line numbers, how do we make sure that they go to the right places? Because everybody's saying they ought to go to Chicago, they ought to go to New York, and of course us at the border, we're saying, hey, this is should be at the border. So that is one. I'd like to find out what is the percentage that go to border communities. 
uh, as opposed to in the interior. And then one of the things I noticed on the policy changes was when we started this program, my intent was it was supposed to be food, shelter, medicine, not for transportation. Uh, recently, there's been transportation costs, uh, you know, in my area. Uh, we don't do that in Laredo, but they do it in San Antonio, as you know. Uh, and I saw that they, you all lifted the limits on available funding uh, for um, travel, I guess for hotels, or should I say shelter, and then you lifted the 45-day limitation, which means that if somebody is supposed to be there for 45 days, now they can be there 60 days. It doesn't affect the top numbers, but this is not, quite honestly, it's not the way I envisioned this program at the very beginning. So I'd like to see your, your thoughts um, on this program. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Quare. Um, the, the SSP program, I think, as you, as you clearly articulated, started out as our emergency food and shelter program um, for humanitarian. We took an existing program and, as directed by Congress, created a new program to support the humanitarian needs and started out with a small amount of money. I mean, as that money has increased, but also as um, entities have asked for additional support to help cover some of the costs that they're incurring, um, I think it was last year we enacted the first ever SSP program, which is now designed to better address the impacts that communities are experiencing. Um, as directed by Congress, transportation is one of those costs that is an acceptable um, reimbursable expense that jurisdictions are receiving. However, we do require... Sorry, yes, no, absolutely. I, 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 I apologize. No, Let that's me okay. Interrupt. Transportation within a locality or transportation from one locality to another locality? In other words, mm -hmm. San Antonio to New York City. Mm -hmm. um, at the beginning, I had looked at local transportation yeah. inside a city, but you're referring to one location to another location. Uh, that is a, an expense that we are reimbursing. Um, I don't believe the way the legislation reads it limits it to just within the jurisdiction. But what we do require is that there is coordination between the sending jurisdiction and the receiving community. And so in order for transportation to be reimbursable, that has to be that level of coordination that happens. Um, I also wanted to address you know, the, the lifting of the cap. It was, it was a cap that we put in place. It wasn't directed by Congress. And what we heard as we continue to try to improve the delivery of this program is that some entities, many of our nonprofits, wanted greater flexibility in the types of um, expenses that they could submit for reimbursement. And so we adapted the program to meet their needs. But I want to be clear, and I think as you clearly stated, Congressman, is that there is no additional funding coming to this. There's still the limit of the amount of money we have. And what I would say is that all of these jurisdictions um, are oversubscribed with how much they're incurring and how much we're able to reimburse. What we attempted to do with this lifting of the cap is to create greater flexibility for them in how they want to submit their expenses for reimbursement. My time's up, but uh, so you're saying that if somebody's in a New York hotel Instead of being there 45 days, they can be paid for 60 days, one. And then if you don't have the answer now, if you all can submit it, yep. how much money on this first tranche, and including last year's money, went to border communities and then interior committees? Yeah, In I my time, sub, but if you all want to submit that. Yeah, I don't have the exact percentages, Congressman, but we'll be happy to get that to you. Um, and, you know, just to add, we're, we're also moving into a competitive program for SSP because we do understand that there is um, changing needs and the intent has always been to create uh, the SSP program as a competitive program instead of a direct allocation so we can get the most current impact that communities or nonprofit organizations are experiencing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Newhouse, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Cuellar, and uh, Administrator Criswell. Thanks for being here with us. And let me say, uh, welcome to the committee, Mr. Chairman. Look forward to your leadership. Thank you for helping me find which room it was in today. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to focus at first on em emergency communications. In the strategic plan that dated 2022 to 26, um, it notes that FEMA must transform how the agency delivers support 
so that partners can increase their capacity and their ability to manage future events. A noble, noble goal. A vital part of a community's ability to manage future events is the ability for the state and the local and the tribal public uh, safety agencies to have reliable and secure commu communications so they can coordinate during a response effort. So while communi emergency communication technologies have advanced, uh, first responders in many of the small and rural communities like I represent in central Washington state, for instance, uh, Benton County in the city of Richland, uh, they're left on the wrong channel because they can't afford to upgrade their communication systems. Uh, Congress has previously provided funding to improve interoperability between public safety agencies at, at all levels, uh, which included support for the purchase of fire and police uh, and uh, radios, uh, construction of towers, uh, training, that kind of thing. Uh, one of these programs was the Public Safety Interoperable Communications Grant Program, which was led by FEMA in collaboration with the National Telecommunications Communications and Information Administration. Um, my understanding that that program is no longer funded, although the FY25 budget proposes creating a new full-time dedicated policy and coordination office for FEMA to focus on climate adaptation and its impacts. So I would argue that ensuring public safety's agencies, especially those in small and rural communities, which you're familiar with in Colorado, uh, th their ability to reliably communicate aligns with FEMA's mission uh, as well as the st strategic plan that I mentioned. So uh, you mentioned that $3.2 billion in requested for grant funding. How, how does this proposal specifically support emergency managers and first responders in, in these small and rural communities? Is there any support for public safety agencies to enhance their communications interoperability? Thank you, Congressman Newhouse. You know, we have a suite of grant programs that are designed to assist communities build their capacity and communications. Having been a firefighter myself, um, I understand the importance of being able to have the interoperable communications to be able to respond regionally to different events. Um, the grant programs that we have through the Homeland Security Grant Program Suite, whether it's our UASI program or the Homeland Security program, those are all eligible expenses for communities to utilize that funding to help increase the, um, the uh, level of capacity needed. I am not familiar with the grant program that you mentioned. Um, I would assume as we were consolidating grants in the past in our Homeland Security Suite that it was included as part of that as an eligible expense. I'm certainly happy to get back to you with more information on that. But I think the key towards the end of your question is really how do we build this capacity for state and local um, public safety workers to include our emergency managers. And it is one of the things that I continue to see as the greatest challenge that we face as we continue to respond, recover, but also build resilience in these communities is the lack of capacity that we have. And so funding these grant programs, whether it's the Homeland Security Suite or our Emergency Management Performance Grant Program, which is the only grant program designed just to support our emergency managers, they're really critical to make sure that they are funded to continue to build that capacity. And communications and all of those programs are acceptable um, items to submit for reimbursement through those grant programs. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just have a short amount of time left, but I wanted to ask about the DRF, the Disaster mm -hmm. Relief Fund, uh, which in which multiple agencies share a, res uh, a responsibility regarding wildfire response, recovery efforts, including awarding of contracts and overall management during wildfire season, which it looks like it's going to be another bad one. Um, this may sound familiar because I think I asked something similar last year. Um, the, the disaster relief fund is at risk of experiencing a shortfall in less than six months. And so as we look forward to a, a long, hot, dry summer, how's your agency preparing to respond to disasters, these disaster, disasters, and what's your What's your communication like with state agencies so they can as well be prepared? Um, as it relates to the Disaster Relief Fund, um, I think as I stated in my opening statement, uh, we are anticipating a shortfall this year um, somewhere perhaps in the August timeframe. Um, 
as we continue to recoup and see what that looks like, uh, we will implement what we did last year, which is immediate needs funding, to make sure we always have enough funding available to support life-saving and life-sustaining activities. Uh, the immediate needs funding just delays recovery projects. It doesn't halt them. It just delays them until the DRF is replenished. Um, but that then just contributes to a greater deficit going forward. Um, we have these communications openly. I personally speak with all of our state directors so they understand the status of our disaster relief fund and what the impact might be on them and their recovery projects. Um, but as it relates to being ready for this disaster season outside of the funding, we continue to work with our state and locals to understand where their gaps are and what we can continue to do to help build their own readiness um, as stated in my strategic plan, uh, a ready FEMA in a prepared nation, and that's about building that capacity, as I talked about with the last question, building that capacity at the state and local level so they have the resources they need to respond uh, to their jurisdictions if one of these severe weather events impacts them. Right. Thank you. Well, thank you for your, for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Maryland, Dr. Harris, is, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you, Administrator Criswell, for being here, and thanks for your service in the past. Um, I'm going to ask about the, the Shelter and Services Program, um, which is administered by FEMA in partnership with CBP. So my first question is, is it funded through FEMA or through CBP or through both or what? Uh, the funding is appropriated to CBP, and then they pass it through to FEMA. Oh, so the, the entire amount is passed through? Yes. Okay, so a little federal shell game here. Okay, because it says in your statement that FEMA's mission is to help people before, during, and after disasters. So do you consider the southern border a disaster? Uh, I am not an immigration expert, Congressman. Um, my role in this is to administer the SSP program as directed by Congress to support jurisdictions that are experiencing costs to support this. Right, so uh, you didn't answer my question. Do you consider the southern border to be a disaster? Because it, otherwise it would be inconsistent with FEMA's mission because your mission says you're supposed to deal with disasters. FEMA's mission is to help people before, during, and after disasters, but we okay. also have oh. a great level of technical capability to provide assistance and technical assistance to solve many different problems sure. that are uh, out but there. But that exists in the entire government. I mean, every, believe me, grants are administered in the entire government. Your agency is the only one that administers local grants. So I'm just curious to who, you know, what rocket scientist made the decision to actually put a border issue into FEMA? Because my people, you know, and I represent the low-lying Eastern Shore of Maryland. I want to thank you, by the way, for the work you're doing with Chris Field on resiliency. They think of disasters as something that's not man-made. I think most people would agree that the southern border disaster is a man-made disaster made by the person in the White House, you know, a few a mile down Pennsylvania Avenue here. And I think it dilutes FEMA. Because when I go and, and my people tell me, well, you know, I want to get, you know, you should get money to FEMA. I go, why? So they can help people cross the border illegally? Uh, this is a sizable chunk of money because if I'm reading it correctly, it not only announces $300 million in direct funding to communities. Now, what, which is the largest recipient of that $300 million? Which community? Um, I'll have to get that data for you. you. You don't know about $300 million that was released last week by your, administra by your administration? I just don't have the breakdown in front well, of me. Well, which of the three largest communities? Which were the ones that were the big, the big guys in this? Uh, certainly, there are. Um, was it New York? Was New York one of them? New York, perhaps, was one of them. And I, again, I don't have the breakdown. And did you come from New York? Um, I spent two years. In you New did. York. So you actually were employed by New York City, and New York is now one of the largest recipients of a what of a grant that I would suggest that some members think makes our borders less secure than more secure. Okay, might be a coincidence, but if you can get that information to me. I'd appreciate that uh, because I'd like to know where those, my constituents would like to know where those $300 million are going. Now, there's also $340 million in what's called uh, uh, $340 million to the Shelter and Services Program competitive grant programs to be allocated for the end of this fiscal year. So is that going to NGOs? So the SSP program, FEMA administers as directed by Congress to provide funding to support communities and nonprofit organizations that um, are experiencing costs to support um, migration. 
Uh, it has always been intended that when uh, the when Congress only, directed it to be changed it to the SSP. I'm talking about the grant program because I'm assuming that the 300 yeah. million that goes to communities is different from the 340 million. That's what your press release. I mean, this is right. this is your press release. No, yes. I, I, so I'm asking specifically about the grant program. The grant program was always intended to be a competitive grant program when it turned from ESFPH to the SSP program. However, with the late appropriation, we had determined we needed to do a direct allocation to get money into the hands of organizations that were experiencing costs while we stood up the competitive program. It will be a competitive program going forward. Any jurisdiction would be eligible that has costs that and they are- And when you mean, when you mean uh, organizations, you mean jurisdictions? It can be a city. It can be a nonprofit organization. Okay. So if you get the information on who are the largest recipients, I'd appreciate that. Now- my real concern is in the last line of this uh, press release, because this is, this is characteristic across the administration. You're aware that we have limitation amendments in, in all the appropriations bills that prohibit lobbying Congress. Mm -hmm. Is that right? So your line that says DHS continues to call on Congress to pass this, the bipartisan border security, security agreement, you don't consider that lobbying, putting that in a press release? I mean, this is, this is a press release from your agency, right? Mm -hmm. You're aware of the limitation amendment. It I says am. you are not to lobby Congress, to spend taxpayer dollars to lobby Congress, and it says DHS continues to call on Congress. Now, I don't know, call on sounds like a synonym for lobbying. I don't know, maybe not. To pass the bipartisan border security agreement. Is it your opinion that is not lobbying? It is my opinion that it's not lobbying. And why is it your opinion that that's not, that calling on Congress to do something is not lobbying? Sir, I'm a member of Congress and I'm reading this. Yeah. How is that not lobbying me? Sir, we, we call on you to pass the budget at the same time, right? Th these are acts that uh, we know will make a difference in supporting these communities, your jurisdictions, we your communities. We believe me, on this side of the dais, we fully understand what lobbying is. We fully understand what this administration is attempting to do. We fully understand that the border is a disaster, but it's a man-made disaster. And honestly, I think this administration is skirting the lobbying uh, restriction, and I hope the next administration takes people like yourself who are lobbying Congress actively through their communications office and, pr and, and act actually prosecutes them under the Deficiency Act. I yield back. Any follow-ups, Mr. Cuellar? Uh, a couple things. Uh, talking about uh, missions that FEMA does, uh, FEMA also has a significant counterterrorism mission also. Is that correct? Uh, we, we have some counterterrorism grants that we provide and support that. Uh, so in other words, uh, FEMA's mission has long been beyond natural disasters also. FEMA's mission has always been to help solve some of our nation's toughest problems, regardless and, of the cause of those problems. And the uh, different locations where the money went to, the $300 million, 275 is already published online. Is that correct? For the SSP program? That's correct. Yes. Okay. Um, let me ask you, Stone Garden, uh, again, this is another program, I think it was in 2008 that uh, Congressman John Cobleson from Houston and myself helped set up uh, back in 2008 that just want to make sure we're still with the mm -hmm. intent, just like the food and shelter program. I think it was called at that time, not the food and shelter program, is the Border Humanitarian Relief Fund. I, I think that was It was the uh, ESFP, the Emergency Food and Shelter Program for Humanitarian Efforts. That was the precursor to the Shelter and Services Program. Correct. Um, can you tell me, uh, let's talk about, let's talk about Stone Garden a little bit. That's mm -hmm. another program uh, that I've been involved with in the very beginning. Um, how is that money used and how is that determined? What is FEMA then gives it to the state and then the Border Patrol chief gets together with the local sheriff and then they decide. Can you go through that process? Because there's been times where uh, you'll have a county judge and say, oh, no, I'm in charge of this, not the yeah. sheriff. Uh, but, again, our intent was Border Patrol chief sits down with the sheriff, and then they decide how to go with right. that, even though the county gets the money. Yeah, absolutely. Ranking Member Quare, uh, the Operation Stone Garden program that we have is incredibly important tool that we have to help 
primarily our border communities enhance uh, their capability um, and the cooperation amongst the agencies that are there. Um, as we get appropriated the funding, uh, CBP works to provide us data as to um, the algorithm that they use with threat and risk to identify which jurisdictions need which amount of money, and we have an algorithmic formula that goes into that. I would say historically, approximately 70% of the Operation Stone Garden funding goes to border communities. Can you get us the percentage also on that? Originally, again, it was just like the um, humanitarian relief. It was a southwest border, but I guess once people see the pot of money, they, they start looking at it. Same thing happened here. It was a southwest border, okay. and then after that, nothing against the northern border, but then the northern border shows, hey, we're border also, so we went. Then under the prior administration, uh, there was a contestant uh, state called Florida, and all of a sudden, money started going to Florida, where there was originally a southwest border, went to the northern border, which I can support, but south, then into Florida. How much money goes into Florida? Nothing against Florida, but again, it's, I, 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 you understand where I'm coming from. A lot of this, these two programs were southwest border. And then w once people see a pot of money, they start saying, well, we want a, pot of, a, yeah. a piece of that pot of money. Do you have the breakdown on that? Uh, I The only breakdown I have, uh, Ranking Member Cuellar, is, is about 70% goes to um, border southwest border communities. I don't have the breakdown okay. for Florida specifically. Um, I do have a breakdown um, for Texas, which received about $37 million um, this past year. Okay. Um, is there a, a court? Uh, so my question was, so when Border Patrol and sets up this plan with the sheriff, it is something that the sheriff and the and the uh, border patrol sh decide what the plan is. Is that correct? Not the county judge, not the county judge, but the sheriff. Do you, do you have that much detail? Can you, or can you follow up on that? Um, I, I can certainly follow up to make sure I'm you know clear on what you're asking. I know CBP you know works with the communities to understand what the sector level risk is to determine what the allocations are. But I think what you're asking is how they administer. The funding and who puts that plan together for administering? Am I? Yes, am I and, and if you don't have that, uh, it's, it's fine. We can. We're happy we can to set up, up a briefing it. to give you more detail about you know from from appropriation to spending the money and what that all looks like. If you don't mind, uh, a yep. little flow chart on that. Uh, can they also use that money? Can local sheriffs or police use some of that money to buy uh, drones? Um, I'm not sure if drones are an authorized expense. We can certainly get that for you. Uh, okay. And for areas like in the southwest border, drones would be good where uh, local sheriffs can use that in coordination with Border Patrol. Yeah, I just don't know um, off the top of my head if that's one of the allowable expenses. Um, it, there's a number of resources that are certainly eligible expenses that uh, enhance the security, and so we'll certainly get you that information. Okay. And then finally, my time's up, but can you also let me know out of Stone Garden how much go to the states? Because uh, I don't like when states stay with a part of money. I want it to go directly right. to the local sheriffs, the local police okay. sheriffs, if you can get that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and with that, my time's up. I just want to say thank you so much for the work that you all do. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Newhouse, follow-up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I understand, uh, Madam Criswell, that uh, the agency is forming an office of climate adaptation. Um, my, my reports that I'm hearing that we're seeing multiple individuals earning over $100,000 a year, which certainly is competitive, but in my district that's a lot of money. And I'd just like to ask some question about the necessity of a new office to uh, respond to climate. Uh, while it, you know, certainly have a lot of good things to say about FEMA, but also uh, some complaints I've heard about the time in uh, coming up with meaningful response. Sometimes uh, some of the issues are not uh, resolved for over a year. Uh, many of the things that people are waiting for to help rebuild communities and so forth. So. Uh, just would like some clarification as to the um, direction that you're taking the agency. Uh, so we recently did a reorganization um, of the resilience side of FEMA, 
And that's the side of our agency that focuses on the before, helping people build um, more resilient communities through our mitigation projects or through uh, individual preparedness or educating communities on what's in the realm of possibility. I think as we see the increase in the number of severe weather events and the cost of these events um, that these communities are experiencing, we want to make sure that we are lifting up all of the work that FEMA does before to help communities become stronger because every dollar that we invest in mitigation saves six dollars in the response and the recovery costs. And so as we form an Office of Climate Adaptation, it's really focused on helping communities understand what they can do to become more resilient and withstand the impacts that these severe weather events are, are causing. And, and that work is just getting off the ground? or This is work results? that we have always been doing as part of our agency. It's always been part of our mission set. I mean, we've just organized it in a way that our state and local jurisdictions now have a central point that they know they can reach out to to get information, technical assistance to help them better understand the steps that they can take to to make their communities more resilient. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No further questions. Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Cloud, the floor is yours. Okay, time's up. We'll go back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your generous, uh, yeah, yeah, Mr. Cuellar. Mr. Cuellar said enough for the Lone Star State, so thanks for your yeah, good sportsmanship. Well, and, and he did a good job, and I would echo, the, echo those sentiments. I was looking through a number of different programs as well, and it seems like communities like New York City and, and other communities are getting a lion's share of some of the uh, funding on a number of these grants when you know, we've been dealing with this for, for several years and certainly have uh, a much higher influx. So I, I would ask you to look at how that's being done in the grant writing process. But um, I wanted to, first of all, just thank you uh, and on behalf of FEMA for the great work being done. Uh, I'm in a coastal district. We just uh, a week ago cut the ribbon on the Packery Channel, which was a Hurricane Harvey project that's taken some years to get done. I know there's still, it's arbitration over a couple million that's left to be done, and I'd, I'd ask you all to, to, to work on that. I think there's a strong case for, you know, that being settled. Um, but uh, but FEMA's made some progress over the years. I, I, I can assure you there's still some work to be done, obviously. But um, uh, but from where we were right after Harvey and and and, the things that we're having to deal with, there, there's been some efforts to, to streamline processes and such. Um, I, I, we are still working on this. Uh, I have a, another city manager in a town of about 20,000 who has applied for a hazard mitigation grant for their generator for their city. Uh, 20,000 people, small town. These are A lot of these small towns do not have uh, the army of lawyers and grant writers and researchers and those kind of things. And I've long advocated for maybe we need a streamlined process for rural communities uh, that are asking for these small dollar grants, that they don't have to go through the same process that, you know, a larger community asking for million dollar grants might need to go. But um, I asked uh, more details on this. Apparently their application was submitted uh, November 5th of of 2021, and they're wondering if they're going to be able to get it in time for hurricane season, you know, this year. Uh, so that's still outstanding, and I, and I would ask that we, you know, just continue to look at that and make sure that rural communities aren't overlooked. You know, they're having a hard time competing for for these dollars because of their staffing situation. Um, but but thank you very very much for the work that is being done. Um, I, I wanted to, of course, touch on the southwest border. You know, when we go and, and talk to the Border Patrol agents about what's going on and we try to follow the dollars to figure out what's happening, uh, a lot of the dollars have been compartmentalized. And so, you know, migrants come to the border, they're processed. Um, I'm not going to get into all of that because that's a different hearing for a different time. But we get to a certain point where it's like, okay, we, we hand off the migrants to NGOs and they're getting funded by FEMA, but we have no idea how that's working. Um, and this is one of the several maybe not a handful at least, of of extra Stafford Act uh, missions, I guess, that FEMA's been on in the last few years. I was wondering if you could could list the extra Stafford Act uh, missions that FEMA's been involved with over the last five years or so. Yeah, so non-Stafford Act missions that we've been involved with? Right. Yes. Uh, so, you know, again, FEMA's 
expertise that we bring to the table is certainly our ability to respond and recover to disasters um, and those that reach the level of a presidential disaster declaration. But we are also, as emergency managers, what I always like to say is chief problem solvers. And our regional administrators provide um, a number of different forms of technical assistance to our states and our local jurisdictions, um, the emergency managers in those communities on a wide variety of problems, um, situations that they're facing, even if they don't rise to the level of a Stafford Act declaration. Um, but specifically, I can tell you, you know, one of the areas, one thing that we did do last year um, was send what we call a federal disaster recovery coordinator to East Palestine, Ohio, um, an executive order that the president issued, and we were able to appoint one of our individuals that is trained in this ability to collaborate. And again, one of FEMA's greatest strengths is the ability to provide that technical assistance, but also to convene the right people to come to the table and to ensure that everybody that has a role to play, whether it's our federal partners or in this case a private sector partner, is doing what they can to support that community being done outside of our Stafford Act authorities. Um, and there has not been a presidential declaration, emergency declaration related to the border? Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of either. Do you understand why? If, if FEMA's involved, it seemed like we, we must think it's a disaster of some sort or some sort of emergency. Yeah, FEMA's role um, in the border is specifically to administer the grant as directed by Congress, which is the Shelter and Services Program grant, mm -hmm. um, and our grant preparedness directorate that administers all of our grants, um, who are experts at administering grants, um, are doing that, and that is that is our role um, in supporting the border. Um, I wanted to speak to one other thing. During a, a March, uh, oh, I'm over time. My apologies, Chairman. Thank you. <laughs> you're, you're Sorry to welcome. wake you up. Um, <laughs> well, actually, I woke up quicker than you did, so. <laughs> Thank you for that observation. The gentleman from Florida is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Criswell, I, I want to talk to you about your role as chief problem solver. <laughs> you mentioned that a mm -hmm. second ago. And I can tell you, I've worked with FEMA as a sheriff for many, many years in, in the northeast Florida through a lot of our hurricane uh, challenges and, and all of that. Uh, I will tell you, and, and I think we spoke about this last year, one of the real challenges that we have in mitigation and recovery is dealing with uh, the supply chains on, on these uh, transformers. Uh, it's getting critical, I think. Um, this, now, what I'm hearing back home this year, the, the smaller ones, uh, not so much of a problem. Um, you know, maybe a few months. But the, but the large uh, transformers, they're talking about a year, more than a year. Um, are, are you all working with anyone to try and, you know, address the supply chain issue on these, on these big transformers? Congressman Rutherford, I know we have had this conversation um, before, and you know I appreciate your continued concern. You know, after you first raised this, we had um, conducted a supply chain analysis specifically to look at transformers, um, as well as other supply chain shortfalls that we might experience going into uh, that hurricane season. I believe this was two years ago that we first had this conversation. Right. I think as we talked about at the time. Uh, there wasn't an issue going into the year, um, but if there were a large number that were used, we potentially would see an impact going forward. Mm -hmm. um, as we continue to go into this hurricane season, uh, we are not seeing um, an impact to our ability to respond to this hurricane season, although we do continue to work with our private sector partners to monitor this because we want to make I, sure. Could I interrupt and yeah, ask, please. what what, um, what are the stockpiles looking like? So we do not have stockpiles. FEMA does not maintain stockpiles for transformers. We work with our no, no, but I mean private, private sector industry. entities. Yeah. Private industry, do you know what they have? Has anybody assessed that? Um, that would be probably fall more within the Department of Energy that would okay. need to understand that. Our goal you know, during a disaster response is to stabilize the right. energy infrastructure, and we do that a number of ways um, through generators, as we had talked about. 
um, helping the the private sector mm. repair and giving them access to the damaged. So, so power is lines. FEMA? So am I am I hearing you say then that FEMA is is kind of relying on uh, energy to take care of the the supply issue on these transformers at all? Yeah, FEMA does not have a role in ensuring that the private industry has a supply of them, but we do want to understand what they think their impacts are going to be. Okay. And we've done the supply chain analysis, which has shown that we don't foresee a, partic a particular um, risk this year. Um, but mm. we do have a private sector office that continues to stay engaged so we can better understand all impacts from the supply chain that yeah. might affect our ability to properly respond and support a community that's been impacted by a severe weather event. Right. Okay, well thank you. And we'll, we'll follow up with them on some of that too. And another issue that I, that I know we've talked about before is, um, you know, oftentimes there's quick assessment, uh, quick recovery, uh, but then the reimbursement drags on sometimes for years. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of these smaller communities are, the, the interest that they're paying is debilitating for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, are, is FEMA looking at a way to maybe computerize uh, some of this information so that we can get billing done more quickly mm -hmm. and, and um, you know, so these folks can get their money uh, faster than, you know, a year or two? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have a number of things that we have done. One, um, with Congress passing our streamlined procedures, it actually takes the majority of our projects um, that are under a million dollars and puts them into our simplified procedures lane, which in essence is helping these smaller communities that the majority of the 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 recoveries that they're doing, the repairs that are doing would fall into that. And so this is a new process for us that is enabling us to help reimburse jurisdictions faster, requiring mm -hmm. less complexity. Um, but we do have- is, is that, that's new? That was in the yeah. last year and a half-ish, uh, yes. Okay, okay. So, so some of the older ones are still working their way through right. under and, the old system. And what we've been doing is we, we send teams, when, when a jurisdiction is really having a challenge, I can send a team right to them and work with them to gather the paperwork. Um, we have mechanisms to be able to advance funding um, if it is a cash flow issue. We have a lot of tools within our toolbox, and if there's a specific jurisdiction um, that you know of that's having difficulties, please let us know, and I'll make sure we send the right people there. Okay. Thank you, and uh, I see my time's out, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, the gentlelady from the state with the uh, first round draft pick in the WNBA, Ms. Henson, <laughs> you are recognized. The floor is yours. That's right. We are very proud of uh, Ms. Caitlin Clark from Iowa. She is uh, up to the game, so to speak, yes. around women's sports. So we love uh, we love Caitlin and the entire team, right? They've done an amazing job. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And uh, Lisa Bluter, well our great coach, too. We want to flag it, uh, all those great women. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this hearing today, and to um, Mr. Aquayer as well um, for your comments. Um, and Administrator Criswell, it's great to see you again. Thank you so much for being before us today. Um, last year, I, I believe I flagged for you um, the challenges surrounding building codes for the competitive brick grant process and kind of how that put um, states like Iowa um, kind of on the back burner in terms of being competitive mm -hmm. for those grants. So I just wanted to tell you straight off the bat, I appreciate you working with my office and my team on that um, to help make that process um, better in terms of eligibility um, and removing those building code requirements um, will enable um, Iowa to pe uh, be more competitive um, for those grants. So I certainly appreciate you working with our team on that. Um, and I know FEMA recently migrated to a new um, payment system for states and localities, FEMA Go. Um, and while commonality within uh, grant management system I think is a good step forward um, for the agency to better streamline, I just want to make sure that we're prioritizing working through some of the bugs in the system. And there's one specifically from Iowa that I wanted to highlight um, from 2022. Iowa Homeland Security Emergency Management um, mistakenly overdrew 40 cents on a grant. So um, very, very small amount. Um, and normally um, they would do an offset on a future draw, for example, to balance out that 40 cent difference, but um, FEMA Go does not allow for that. And okay. so uh, Iowa had to write a 40 cent check and send it uh, back to FEMA. FEMA cashed the check, 
but the credit was not made to their account within FEMA Go. So then every quarter since then, they have received um, an RFI asking about the open project and the payment um, needed for mm -hmm. that. 40 cent difference. So um, common sense would say that doesn't seem right. So we'll make absolutely. Sure we so yeah, what's your plan that? to address that? I mean, obviously, uh, you know, you think about the administrative overhead to go after 40 cents yeah. here on, uh, you know, on an agency level. Um, are, are these new bugs? Have you heard about this from any other state um, or municipality? I have not heard about that at all. I have, you know, a number of our state directors certainly um, are not afraid to share with us some of the frustrations that they have, and we continue to work with them um, as as we were rolling this out, and now that it's fully enabled, um, but this is a new one um, at that level, and so I'll certainly take a look at that. Yeah. I offered to bring forty cents from my tax check <laughs> to, I understand. to pay yeah. it off, but uh, they said they were handling it. So I appreciate you uh, committing yeah. to work with our team on that um, to alleviate user concerns going forward. Um, another area we talked about. I mean, I was going to experience severe weather today. Um, already is right now. Um, last year we talked about the Next Generation Warning System grant program and um, what it provides for resilience and security of public broadcasting systems when severe weather strikes. Um, obviously, that's essential, that communication for saving lives and um, helps to make sure that we can um, get those alerts out. Uh, one concern that I've had with that program is um, uh, delays in deploying grant funding for the Corporation of Public Broadcasting to administer those grants to local stations. Um, and so I think, you know, when you talk about process, if FEMA awarded the grant funding in the first place to establish the program, why should CBP have to, or CPB rather, now have to run every grant through FEMA granting authorities. I think, could there be a better solution there in terms of streamlining that process to make sure that- Yeah, I think absolutely. I did get an, an update on this situation here recently, um, and, and there are some challenges with how this program is being administered, and so we are working hard right now to figure out the best way to streamline that, um, because being able to, to have the appropriate funding to enable the next generation warning system is really critical to protecting our citizens. So we, we are aware of the, the challenges and we are working on them and we're happy to provide you an update on where we're at. Yeah, I certainly appreciate that and obviously um, they they, uh, they know what they're doing and getting those resources out the door yes. and I think just streamlining it will help to make sure we can keep people safe um, as quickly as possible. Um, it's critical to their role in civil um, defense and public safety. So. Um, I think that's all the questions I had for this first round. So, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Gentleman from Texas is recognized for follow-ups. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to ask you uh, about the FEMA's program page for the EFSPH awards made under the Consolidations Appropriation Act of uh, 2023. Uh, there's a number of payments that were made, millions and millions of dollars, but we're unable to find the details about what programs or projects or funds they went toward. Um, I, I would love to see accounting on on who's receiving these grants. Can you provide that to us? Yeah, I, I believe we should be able to provide you whatever level of detail you need on that first program, the ESFP Humanitarian Program, which is now the SSP program. Yeah, we, we've looked through the websites and can't find anything. I don't think we would have it on our public-facing website, but I'll be happy to have the team okay. um, get with your staff and provide you a, a briefing on where the money has gone. Thank you. That, that would be very, very helpful. I also wanted to ask you about a DHS OIG audit uh, of FEMA during the March 2024 testimony before the TNI Subcommittee on Economic Development, Public Buildings, and Emergency Management, the Deputy Inspector General for Audits testified that FEMA's use of resources for non-natural disasters has revealed that FEMA does not have sufficient controls in place to prevent fraud, waste, and abuse. Uh, DHS conducted 18 audits over the past four years that identified overpayments, ineligible payments, unsupported, and unallowable costs totaling approximately 3.9 billion in improper payments. That's a lot of money, you know, at least to some of us. Uh, DHS audited and also identified an additional 45.4 million in funds that could be put to better use. Uh, what are you, what are you doing to to work on controls that could keep us from, you know, taxpayer dollar going to to waste, fraud, and abuse? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we take any concerns um, about fraud, fraudulent use of our programs very seriously, and we appreciate the partnership that we have with the Inspector General's office. Um, specifically, one of the items that was raised in there was regarding our lost wages program, and that is, you know, a program that was directed under the previous administration to, to support um, individuals that were impacted by COVID-19. Um, and in that program, it was directed that uh, self-certification be done at the state level, um, and that is where I think the majority of the um, issues that the IG found um, within that report 
this is a program that was not necessarily designed um, to be part of FEMA's programs. It's not something that we've done in the past, not something I certainly ever want to do again. Um, but we do have, for our traditional programs, the appropriate level of controls in place to ensure that the funding is going to where it needs to be. Okay. Perhaps we can meet with your staff to get a better insight sure. on that as well. Thank you. Appreciate it. I yield, Chairman. Thank you for that courtesy. The general lady from the general lady from Iowa is recognized for follow-up. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, um, as I mentioned, Administrator Criswell, uh, we are in the bullseye again for severe weather today in Iowa, um, and we need urgent responses, obviously, to deal with those natural disasters. And a key stressor that I continue to hear about back home is. Um, the need for uh, a universal application for disaster survivors. Um, it's extremely difficult, as you know, for them to locate paperwork um, in an emergency, and um, it can be bur burdensome for those who are experiencing that devastation. Um, lots of delays, confusion, um, and not knowing how to coordinate all the information between, I call it the alphabet soups, right, the, the FEMA, HUD, SBA, all the other federal agencies that someone may need to interface in the time of a natural disaster. And, um, the last thing they need when they're dealing with derecho wind damage, uh, tornadoes, flooding is burdensome paperwork and having to submit dozens of applications across several agencies, um, not to mention they might have lost all those documents that they need. So um, could you describe how FEMA can maybe work better with other agencies going forward to um, become more unified in response um, to these disasters while also working to ease that paperwork burden on our survivors? Yeah, absolutely. One thing that I'll start with is uh, we recently um, released an interim final rule to how we administer our individual assistance program. And one of the things that we continue um, to have heard is the frustration with having to apply for an SBA loan, get denied, and then come to FEMA to get assistance. And so part of this new release is we have uh, decoupled that so we make it easier and have eased the burden on the individual. Now they, they can either apply for both simultaneously or just go through the FEMA program. And we think that's also a step in the right direction to really help understand what the customer experience is and making sure that we're making it easy as possible for them. Um, but we continue to work with our partners also at SBA um, to create a unified um, universal application. And we have been having ongoing discussions at the staff level on the best way to do that. Um, working through login.gov is one of the, the primary tools and platforms that we would be able to use. And so this is definitely something that we continue to work towards. We are not there yet, but we are continuing to drive and figure out the best way to get there because we do know um, how difficult it is to try to navigate, as you said, the alphabet soup, which is true. There's so many different programs that are out there, and we want to make it as simple as possible for them. And simplicity, obviously, if you're entering the same information um, yes. and it's redundant process over and over and over again, I mean, that is the uh, element of frustration that yes. Iowans and Americans certainly face. So um, I look forward to working with you um, as you keep those concerns in mind going forward um, to, to better strengthen that federal interagency coordination. I think that's going to be critical. Um, and it'll save taxpayer money, too, in the process. And I think that's a win-win. Um, are there uh, grant programs um, like um, NGWS, BRICS, pre-disaster mitigation, um, nonprofit security, or firefighter grants where you're seeing an increased level of applications um, and you're maybe unable to fund projects because of um, any budget restrictions that you might face? Uh, I would say across all of our grant programs um, that are competitive, they are certainly oversubscribed. Um, I believe our BRIC program this year is oversubscribed like five to one for what we're gonna be able to give. And so that is our number one tool that we have to be able to go out and build resilience in communities. Um, the the non-competitive grant programs like UASI and our State Homeland Security program or our EMPG program, you know, they're, they're limited at the, the amount of funding that is appropriated, but we know that there is greater need because we know that the capacity at our state and local level is not where it needs to be. And so that is the one tool that they have to help increase their capacity to be able to respond and recover as well as mitigate against these types of severe weather events. Um, and so those are the programs that we would hope that we can continue to fund um, to support these communities. Well, um, Administrator, I find it in incredibly frustrating to um, see um, a $4.7 billion slush fund request from Secretary Mayorkas to direct those funds to deal specifically with misguided priorities at the southern border um, for surge conditions when um, these billions of dollars could be using to go help those programs that are clearly oversubscribed and 
and have a direct and immediate need and impact on our constituents. So um, I'd urge the administration to prioritize here. Um, Secretary Mayorkas just admitted last week in this committee that there is in fact a crisis at our southern border. They are uh, redirecting your employees in many cases to help deal with that. And um, I'd urge the administration to, um, to uh, come to center on this, uh, make sure that the dollars can actually go where they need to go, um, declare the crisis uh, at our southern border, um, and address this in a meaningful way. And with that, um, Mr. Chair, I will yield back. Thank you. Um, Madam Administrator, thank you for being the first victim, participant, whatever, under the new, uh, I don't know what we call this, <laughs> under the new whoever lost the coin flip for, for <laughs> chairing this. Um, and, and if there are folks outside the room listening, um, j just to, to give an idea, I've got a couple issue areas that, that, that I'd like to not talk with you about now because, quite frankly, I don't think a five-minute discussion is, is going to be meaningful. But, but I do want to say, I want to know, it's come up in, in, in the course of some of the questioning, kind of the lessons learned when you talk about uh, uh, disaster relief funds and, and what you've learned from immediate needs and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and it's in the context of, so we know what we think we didn't like, here's how we plan to change that, or here's the help you need from this committee or somebody else in terms of making you folks more nimble, transparent, whatever the heck. Nobody leave the room and say that's a criticism, I'm just saying we ought to learn from our experiences and that's an area that we probably should. Another area that, that I'm gonna wanna talk about a little bit with you folks is um, on FMAGs. Mm -hmm. and, and, and not that FMAGs are a Western thing, but not everybody's like California that has a multi-million dollar agency that's, that's very easy to work with um, and crosses all the T's and dots all the I's. I, I get the, 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 the potential for abuse and all that other sort of stuff, but I just kind of want to understand how those, how those rural areas, not just Western, but rural and other parts of the country that may not have the luxury of an emergency management office at the state level that's hand in glove with you folks, what do we do to make sure that when they submit, um, they're doing so well informed instead of somebody through the windshield of, of, of a fire engine while, the, while they're looking at the flames, which isn't the strongest submission for you folks to carry out your mission. Um, and then um, th the last thing I think that's, that, that's of interest is um, the formula used to, to calculate allowable adjustment for disaster relief. You like it? Why do you like it? In the context of some of the testimony today, um, once again, what can we do going forward? if anything. And then the last thing I want to talk to you about is the timing of responses, which kind of ties into the calendar of the committee. So um, we're going to have our last hearing on May 1st. Um, and as we talk about trying to do 12 appropriations bills, and somebody mentioned uh, September 30th, and I won't even go there, but um, when members have questions or, or whatever, and we will stand ready to help you, in terms of making sure that we get that information exchanged so that we can proceed from the end of May, the, the, the beginning of May, I, I don't know when the, the committee markup will be, but it's like, hey, we'd, we'd kind of like to, um, and nobody should leave the room and use the word haste, but you can use the word crisp. Um, we we want to get our work done and, and, and in, in a way that allows the committee to go to markup in a timely fashion, transparent manner, no surprises to anybody so that then we can get in the queue for big appropriations to do that stuff and then go have whatever the rodeo demands on, on the floor. So um, we will be tracking um, just, you know, if there's committee members that want to deal with you directly on things, obviously that's fine. We just want to track it so it's not one of those things where we're waiting um, to get a response in order to, and it slows the committee stuff down. And that doesn't mean that we expect you to, now here's your new mission in addition to everything else you do, hoping that the hurricanes don't hit and, the, and all the other sort of stuff. Um, but obviously we're all in multitasking business. So I just kind of forewarned is forearmed. Um, and, and so with that, we'll let you go. Thank you, uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, members may submit additional questions for the record and we ask that you respond to those in a timely manner. Um, I'm not gonna define timely, but if I was going to, it's a few weeks, not a few months. Um, and, and, so, and if there's a problem with responding, then let us know so 
it's like, well, we need a, we need the question clarified or whatever. But anyhow, we want to kind of keep proceeding towards the goal line wherever that is. And uh, so with that, uh, thank you very much, Madam Administrator, and we're adjourned.